Europe and the world, new encounters, 1500 to 1800, which is better known as the age of exploration. On the brink of the new world, travels of John Mondeville spoke of realms which the author had not seen, filled with gold and precious stones, giants who eat the flesh of men. The Polos, Niccolo and Marfello, were merchants from Venice who were accompanied by Marco, Niccolo's son, to the great court of Kublai Khan in 1271. Travels was the most informative account of Asia. So important was the work that Columbus carried it with his, on his first voyage. The economic motive, the Ottoman Turks had cut off the land route to Asia and added to the breakup of the Mongol Empire. Empires were looking for a sea route to Asia. The spices were very expensive and they want to cut out the Muslim middlemen. Merchants, adventurers, and government officials had hoped to gain precious metals and spices. There was also the religious zeal, a secondary motive. Portugal and Spain had driven the Muslims out of Europe in the Middle Ages. Spain was united in 1492 with the defeat of the Moors, and they were seeking the glory of God to seek glory, and of course, gold, the means for exploration. Potrolani were charts that were very detailed, done by mathematicians and navigators in the 13th and 14th century. Ptolemy was the geography that was translated into Latin, was finally made available in 1477. These showed the three continents and the oceans, and that they were actually really smaller, and to believe that there were only two. The tools of navigation that would help in the age of the discovery. Caravels were ships that sailors could travel on faster and longer distance by sailing into the wind. The astrolabe was used by astronomers and navigators to measure the altitude above the horizon of a celestial body, day or night. It can be used to identify stars or planets, to determine local latitude, given local time and vice versa, to survey or to triangulate. Arabs used them to cross the desert, so why not oceans? The compass points to the magnetic north, gives degrees, and one could sail on a specific point, for example, 270 degrees due west. The hourglass was needed to help keep the correct time to correlate with the use of the astrolabe and the cross staff. The cross staff was used to determine angles, for instance, the angle between the horizon and Polaris or the sun to determine a vessel's latitude or the angle between the top and the bottom of an object to determine the distance of said object if its height is known, or the height of the object of the distance is known, or the horizontal angle between the two visible locations to determine one's point on the map. Finally, the log, a paddle that was the end of a line, the line was tied to a series of knots. The log was thrown out in time for 30 seconds. The sailor then would reel in the log and count the number of knots the ship was going. Hence came nautical miles. New Horizons, the Portuguese and the Spanish Empires. In 1419, Henry the Navigator established a school for maritime purposes and sponsored trips to Africa. In 1441, the first Africans were brought to Europe as slaves and within several years, 1,000 slaves were shipped to Lisbon. Gold was also discovered in the southern part of Africa. Portugal would establish trade in Central Africa along the mouth of the Zaire, which is known as the Congo River today. For commerce, international banking and corporations emerged as joint stock companies financed exploration. Portugal, Spain, France, and England would emerge as nations. Monarchs would want to use whatever they gain and invest it into new weapons. Bartolomeo Diaz in 1497 rounded the southern part of Africa at the Cape of Good Hope. Vasta da Gama went past the Cape of Good Hope and arrived in Calcutta, India on May 18, 1848. He arrived back in Lisbon with only one ship full with spices that netted the investors with several thousand percent in profit. Admiral Alfonso de Albuquerque in Gala in 1510 served as the headquarters for the entire region of India. 
Malacca in 1511 was able to destroy the Arab spice trade. And Albuquerque cut off the right hand of the men and noses and the ears of women. Portugal had a monopoly on the spice trade from the east. And they had succeeded in destroying Arab influence due to their naval technology and heavy gun. So this map shows the discoveries and possessions in the 15th and 16th centuries, mostly of the Spanish and French and their routes that they would take. Later would arrive the Dutch, the English, and the French. Columbus was an Italian who was educated in seamanship in Portugal. He persuaded King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella of Spain to finance his trip across the Atlantic Ocean, searching for a western passage to Asia. The voyage began on August 3, 1492. Columbus and his crew set sail with three ships, the famous Santa Maria, the Pinta, and the Nina. They sighted land on October 12th and landed in the Bahamas and other islands in the Caribbean. Columbus was convinced that he had landed at an island off the coast of Asia, but he certainly met some people known as Tanyos in the Caribbean island. He mistakenly thought they were from Asia and named them Indians, and the name would stick. There were four voyages that Columbus would undertake. The first one, he would also explore the Bahamas before discovering and exploring Cuba. After exploring Hispaniola, Santo Domingo, the flagship was wrecked and a post was established at La Navidad because it happened on Christmas Day. Men were left behind when he returned home by 15th March after stopping the Azores in Lisbon. In a second voyage that set out on September 25th, 1493, to June 11, 1496, sailing from Cadiz with 17 ships and 1,200 men, including his brother Diego. When Columbus returned to Navidad on November 27, 1493, he found it burned to the ground, nobody in the vicinity. In the fields nearby, however, he discovered the bodies of eight Christians. He abandoned the area and explored the Leeward Islands in Puerto Rico before discovering the destruction of the original post. A second post was established at Isabella on January 2, 1494, on Santo Domingo. Additional exploration occurred on Santo Domingo, Jamaica, and Hispaniola. Isabella was abandoned and the city of Santo Domingo was established in 1496. Columbus left a second brother, Bartholomew, and charged the island before returning to Spain on March 10, 1496, arriving in Cadiz on June the 11th. His third voyage set out on May 30, 1498, to 25 November 1500, this time with seven ships. Columbus left for Santo Domingo, dividing his fleet at the Canaries. He sighted South America before arriving at Santo Domingo on 31 August. The colony was in a state of rebellion. Spain's new governor, Francisco de Bababdila arrived on 23rd August and sent three brothers, Columbus, to Spain in chains in October. Although restored to their honors, they never regained their authority, which was retained by the Spanish crown. His final voyage from May 1502 to November 1504, he only had four ships and he left Cadiz and landed at Martinique on June 15th. He later sailed to Honduran coast and explored to the south as far as central Panama. He was shipwrecked and marooned in Jamaica for 12 months before he was finally rescued and returned home. Professional Explorers Sponsored by nation states, the new profession of professional explorers emerge. By citing new lands, that is, those not already claimed by Europeans, nations could claim primacy of their soil, thus making their profession very desirable. John Calvert was an Italian sailing for England's King Henry VII in 1497, discovered a new found land, which later became Canada. Cabot's voyage later allowed England to assert its claims to all of North America. Political, economic, and religious conflict in England and its closer Irish colony, combined with conflict with nearby France, undermined further attempts at English colonization until the 1600s. Amerigo Vespucci was a mapmaker 
named the Miracle of Vespucci, was the first to suggest in 1499 that the new landmass encounter was too large to be an island and must be a continent. America was named in his honor. Other European explorers, such as Vasco Nuez de Balboa, explored the Americas. Balboa became the first recorded European to see the Pacific Ocean from the New World in 1513, having landed at the Isthmus of Panama and traveling west. Ferdinand Magellan and Sebastian del Cano sailed on behalf of the Spanish. Ferdinand Magellan's crew would be the first to circumnavigate the globe, although Magellan did not live to complete the voyage. After Magellan's death in the Philippines, Sebastian del Cano led the vastly diminished crew back along the more familiar regions of the East Indies, Indian Ocean, and up to the Atlantic Ocean to Spain. Only one of the five ships would return. Columbus's voyages helped Spain claim jurisdiction over the Americas from the European perspective. This right was contested by other emerging Western European nation states, but was confirmed by Pope Alexander VI at the Treaty of Tordillas in 1494, which was signed by the Pope, Spain, and Portugal. This gave Spain claims over the non-Christian portions of the Western Hemisphere, and Portugal claims over the non-Christian portions in the Eastern Hemisphere. The demarcation line moved the dividing line 100 leagues west, which eventually gave Portugal claim over what would become Brazil, which Pedro Cabral in 1500 accidentally discovered for Portugal. Portugal's control at the time of the African slave trade made it the major provider of enslaved Africans to the Americas until the Dutch and then the English took over the control in the 17th and 18th centuries. The Mayas, Incas, and Mexica. A fresco depicting the social divisions of the Mayan society, a Mayan priest at the center is ceremonially dressed. Permanent farming towns emerged in Mexico around 1500 BC, populated by the Mayans. The Mayan culture eventually collapsed around AD 900, probably due to a variety of factors, one which was their impact on the ecosystem. The dominance of the Mayans in Mesoamerica was replaced by the Toltecs, whose power in the region diminished around AD 1200. The Incas. The Inca Empire, named for their leader, or Inca, in the Andes Mountains of the Western South America, made up a realm about 2,500 miles by the 15th century, created a highly centralized state with Cusco as, as its capital. Inca means ruler, and then they expanded the empire, divided into four quarters ruled by a governor. The Empire of Rhodes. 24,800 miles north and south of Rhodes were built in the Andes Mountains. Farther south, in present-day Colombia, the Chicopax built an empire similar to that of the Aztecs, but on a much smaller scale. The Mexica, or Aztecs were known for the military prowess. Aztecs would capture and then sacrifice their enemies. The Mexica, known as the Europeans as Aztecs, moved from a place that they claimed was the original homeland, Aztalan, into central Mexico. By about 1325, they had taken over control of most of the area of today's central Mexico, and they built their largest city, Tenochtitlan, now Mex Mexico City. This society dominated the region and awed the Spanish conquistadors, or conquerors, with their power, trade, connections, marketplaces, and buildings. In addition, the Mexica were highly religious. Their polytheistic religion includes deities connected to natural elements around them, such as the sun, moon, stars, and animals. The religion of the Mexica and most other Mesoamerican societies required the regular offering of live human sacrifices associated with elaborate rituals. Most of the human sacrifices were more vulnerable members of society, include those captured in war, slaves, women, and children. The Mexica's warfare and capture and demand for tribute and human sacrifices from those around them would help Hernán Cortés, a Spanish conquistador, as men to conquer the Aztecs and 1519. The Spanish Empire. 
Spain's Caribbean islands provided rich resources and trading ports. Cuba especially emerged as the seat of Spanish power in the Americas. And due to the Treaty of Torcidas, Spain wasted no time in establishing itself in the New World, and within a generation it inserted itself firmly into the civilizations there. Conquistador is the Spanish word for conquerors, who were professional soldiers, who were recognized as the best military men in the world at the time. Instead of working for a regular salary, they received a share in any plunder gained from conquest. This helped them make them less willing to show mercy to captives or defeated enemies. Hernan Cortez would land in Mexico in 1519 with a force of 600 men, 17 horses, and 10 cannons. Cortez had several things going for him. First, Spain had significant technological advancement over the Indian tribes in Mexico, such as iron, sail-powered ships, cannons, and domesticated horses. These often made up for the tremendously outnumbered. When he landed, it was reported to the Emperor Montezuma, the gods have come back. Their lances spit fire, their warriors have two heads and six legs, and they live in houses that float. Second was Donna Marina, a Native American woman, was his interpreter and guide throughout the Aztec Empire, where he learned that the great king Montezuma lived in a magnificent city beyond the mountains, and that his armies, lined up in a field, would cover it like the waves of the sea. But he also informed that many vassal kings who owed allegiance to the emperor secretly detested him and were ready to support anyone who might help them throw off the hatred Aztec yoke. Third, he is considered by the Aztecs to be an em emissary or the feathered semper god Quetzalcoatl, or Quetzalcoatl himself. Legend said that this god vowed to return to destroy the Aztecs. The whole Aztec empire was filled with foreboding as comets raced across the sky in broad daylight. And fourth, diseases such as smallpox, which the Native Americans had no immunity. After first defeating the natural enemies of the Aztecs in 1519, and through persuasion, he is able to enter the forces into Tenochtitlan in a peaceful manner. He befriended Emperor Montezuma and gained control of the Aztecs' gold and silver mines. However, the emperor was killed, and Cortes and his men had to flee for their lives. When Cortes returned in 1520 to 1521, he persuaded many of the Aztec natural enemies to join with the conquistadors as they marched on the Aztec capital city. Much of the empire was already devastated by European diseases, which made the conquering much easier. The Incas had a centralized state. The empire of 7 million reached over 1,000 miles along the Andes Mountains from present-day Ecuador to Chile. The Incas had a very efficient centralized authoritarian state, controlling agriculture and commerce with a more sophisticated administrative structure than the Aztecs. They were good road builders and an effective communication system and skilled metallurgists. Their political system, the monarch had absolute power and his administration was financed by a complex system of taxation that accumulated labor service for state-run projects in mining, road building, and working in special fields set aside for the royal family. In exchange for their obligation to the state, the Inca people had access to government granaries in times of bad harvest, a type of modern welfare state. One major weakness, they had no fixed procedure for succession. The monarch typically picked his heir from the most competent of his sons, which made sense, but established no clear line of succession in the time of crisis. Like the Aztecs, the Incas were aggressive and expansionist with violent religious rites and powerful military force. Unlike the Aztecs, the Incas tried to assimilate conquered peoples rather than treating them simply as tribute states. In 1532, Francisco Pizarro and 180 men armed with horses, gunpowder, and steel weapons followed rumors of even greater riches than those of Mexico, discovered the Inca Empire high in the Peruvian Andes. The Spaniards arrived at a moment of weakness of the empire and there was civil war. There was no named successor at the death of the previous emperor, so war had broken out. At Ahupa, the victor was on his way from the empire's northern provinces to claim his throne in Cusco, much weakened, when Pizarro intercepted, captured, and killed him. The Spaniards then captured Cusco 
eventually extended control over the whole empire and established a new capital at Lima. By 1550, Spain's new world empire stretched from the Caribbean through Mexico to Peru. New Spain. By the 16th century, Spain's settlements in the New World stretched from South America to the southern portion of North America. In order to maintain these civilizations, the encomienda system was established. By rewarding faithful officers with land grants and control of the neighboring villages and Indian tribes, Spain hoped to able better cultivate its resources while establishing a support system for its missions. By this time in the West Indies, the Native American population had been virtually wiped out by disease, making it necessary to import African slaves who had already been exposed to diseases of the old world to take their place. Impact of the slave trade, some 10 million sold into slavery between the 16th and 19th centuries. Villages and empires were destroyed by these losses. Administration of the Spanish Empire. Viceroy's New Spain in Peru, New Spain, consisted of Mexico, Central America, and the Caribbean capital, Mexico City. Peru's capital was Lima. The social structure. Peninsulares were born in Spain and were the only ones that could act as governors and viceroys. Creoles were 100% pure Spanish blood, but their sin was that they were born in the Americas. They could only attain office, but never governor or viceroy. Mestizos was a mixture of native and the Spanish blood. The Spanish encouraged their Spanish uh, men to marry the Native American women. Mulattoes was a mixture of African and European blood. Then came the natives, and then finally the slaves. The audiences were supreme judicial bodies who advised the viceroy, and the ecclesiastical affairs came under the Catholic Church. Franciscans, Dominicans, and Jesuits converted the natives by the thousands. The hierarchy of the church as well established in the Spanish New World. A Catholic Empire Throughout the various religious orders of the Catholicism, the empire hoped to establish a Christian empire in the New World. Differing methods existed for converting the heathen natives to Catholicism, but by the end of the 16th century, most believed it was easier to convert them by force than by persuasion. Bartolomeo de las Casas, a priest in Cuba, published his account of the Spaniards' treatment of the natives, which led to the Spanish crown to reconsider their colonial policy in the New World. Despite Philip II and other Spanish monarchs' efforts to promote better treatment of Native Americans, however, many colonists preferred to ignore royal decrees and treated these populations harshly. Spanish Florida Juan Ponce de Leon in 1513 established a short-lived colony in the Carolina coast and explored in name Florida Pascua de la Florida, the Festival of Flowers, because he found it on Easter Sunday. Panfino de Narvez explored from Florida to the Mississippi River, although he drowned at sea in the process. Hernando de Soto traveled across much of present-day America south and then up the Mississippi and Arkansas rivers. He, too, would die during the exploration. French Huguenots, or French Protestant exiles, built a fort in present-day Jacksonville named Fort Caroline. Pedro Menendez de Avias was dispatched by the Spanish crown and a group of 1,500 soldiers and colonists and established St. Augustine in northern Florida, partly in response to the threats of the French Huguenots. Protestant Calvinists colonized the region to protect Spanish settlements. St. Augustine was established in 1565, is the longest surviving permanent European settlement in the present day United States. De Avedez was successful in defeating and driving out the French. New arrivals on the world stage, Africa and the beginnings of the slave trade. Songhai had controlled the Trans-Siberian trade. Benin had dominated the Niger Delta, leading the expansion of the Oba, or ruler. Uwera was in goldsmithing and brasssmithing, and they exchanged ambassadors with Portugal. The Congo were small kingdoms under one ruler, 
the Mani Congo, who lived in modern Angola. They could be either a man or a woman, interesting, and they knew how to smelt iron ore. Their culture was similar to the Native Americans. They saw spirits in the living and the dead, and sugar plantations were set up on the two islands off Africa's coast. The Dutch East India Company would establish a trading post in southern Africa, and the Boers, Dutch farmers, would found an equitable climate free of tropical diseases. Portugal would bring in about 1,000 slaves a year into Europe, mostly to be used as domestics. Sugar plantations in the central coast of Africa, they were in need of labor and changes the nature of slavery. And later, they're going to be shipped off to the Caribbean and Brazil to raise sugar. Growth in the slave trade. 275,000 enslaved Africans were exported during the 16th century. One million Africans were exported in the 17th century. Six million Africans were sent out in the 18th century. Altogether, as many as 10 million Africans were sold into slavery. The slave ships were very heavy ocean-going ships, and the slave traders could make a lot of money off the cost of the slaves. And usually where these slaves came from was from African tribal leaders. Europeans would trade guns, mechanical clocks, and anything that seemed desirable for a number of slaves. In the African's mind, slavery was only a temporary, it was not a permanent situation. The voyage from Africa to the Americas was referred to as the Middle Passage. Now, those who were placed on these ships, it's estimated that 20% died on the way to the Americas. Recent scholarship has also discovered that the sailors on board the slave ships died at an even higher rate. It was the dangers of going on an ocean-going vessel in this time. And if too many slaves had died in transport, the captain, sometimes greedily, would clap his own crew members into chains and sail, sell them as slaves to make up the loss. So here we see the, which is the route of the Middle Passage in which the slaves went from Africa to the Americas. What you mostly notice is the individuals where they were. Brazil, this is for sugar as well. The Caribbean, which will be for sugar. And then the beginning, once the English established colonies, that would be for tobacco, rice, and indigo. The effects of the slave trade, the economic price, the importation of cheap manufactured goods undermined the cottage industry, forcing the families into poverty. Depopulation and the youngest and the strongest of the natives were gone. The political effects, the need for slaves led to constant warfare between African tribal chiefs armed with the new European weapons. Benin was once a brilliant and creative high society in the 16th century, but because of the slave trade, the population decreased as warfare increased. The people lost their spirit and their faith in the gods. Human sacrifices increased. By the 19th century, Benin was a savage and corrupt place. The opposition to slavery would begin with a society of friends known as the Quakers, who criticized slavery in the 1770s. The radical stage of the French Revolution, the French would abolish slavery. Britain would finally abolish slavery in 1807. In fact, Liverpool, which became the greatest slaving port in human history, shows how some of the today's high street banks, insurance companies, had met their foundations in slavery. The West and Southeast Asia. Portugal could not hold on to their empire. It was too small for the task. Spain began to establish a base and subdued the Philippines. The Dutch would defeat the Portuguese at Fort Molocas and eventually push them out of the spice trade. They'd eventually take over modern-day Sri Lanka. Batavia was the name of the fort that the Dutch established on Java, Jakarta. And by the end of the 18th century, the Dutch had control of the entire Indonesia archipelago. Vietnam was one of the three, Burma and Thailand, who proved to be successful in driving the Europeans out. The Europeans would side with disputing factions in the country. In Vietnam, Western merchants and missionaries 
coincided with a period of internal conflict, dividing the country into North and South, Dutch and French. Out of the 17th century, the Dutch moved on because there was no economic opportunity to stay, and the French missionaries decided to stay in Vietnam. The mainland was a lot harder to conquer because it was more cohesive politically, and with a lack of spices, it was not very interesting to the Europeans. The French and British in India. The Mughal dynasty was the line of Muslim emperors who reigned in India from 1526 to 1858. Babur, the first Mughal emperor, was a descendant of the Turkish conqueror Timur on his father's side, and the Mongol and Persian Mughal conqueror Genghis Khan on his mother's side. They invaded India from Afghanistan and founded the Mughal Empire on the ruin of the Delhi Solne. From 1526, when Babur defeated Sultan Ibrahim Lodi, the ruler of Delhi, had established himself in neighboring Agara until 1638, when his great-great-grandson, Shah Jinnah, built a new capital city in Delhi again. Agra was a repository for the wealth and talent of one of the most extensive empires in the medieval world. Akbar, his grandson, would rule most of India. The impact of the Western powers as usual, the Portuguese were the first to arrive by the end of the 16th century. And then, as usual, the British and the Dutch arrived and began to push them out. By 1650, the, Port the British had trading posts at Surat, Fort William, Calcutta, near Bengal Bay, and Madras, a great producer of Indian cotton, to the East Indies to barter for spices. The British were successful and attracted the Dutch and the French. The French began to establish forts and capture Madras. Sir Robert Cleave, general in chief and representative of the East India Company, consolidated control of Bengal, where the local ruler had imprisoned the local British population at Fort William and throw them into prisons known as the Black Hole of Calcutta. At the Battle of Plassey in 1757, 3,000 British regulars defeated over 30,000 Indians. The result, the British East India Company is allowed to collect taxes in areas surrounding Calcutta. The French would be completely driven out after the defeat in the Seven Years' War in 1756 to 1753. The British East India Company would exert its power to where they controlled all of India, where it would become a colony in 17, 1858. China, the Ming Dynasty, its empire stretched from the steppes of Central Asia to the China Sea, from the Gobi Desert to the rainforests of Southeast Asia. They extended the rule to Mongolia and reconquered Vietnam. A series of weak rulers would lead to their defeat by the Mongols in 1644. The Qing Dynasty, or pure Manchu Dynasty, became very powerful thanks to strong rulers like Kangxi and Yanglong, who would rule for the first 100 years. Their decline began with the arrival of the Europeans. Western inroads. Russia had a trade agreement in 1689. Canton was a British trading post in 1699. The chief exports were tea and silk to England. Lord McCartney in 1793 pressed for even more access to the cities but was denied by the Emperor Kwai Long. Japan Takugawa Yashu became the shogun, which was the general, in 1603 and restored the central authority of Japan until 1868. Opening to the West Once again, the Portuguese were the first to land in Japan in 1543, and the Japanese were fascinated with European goods, eyeglasses, clocks, and especially weaponry. Francis Xavier in 1549 was a Jesuit missionary who was somewhat successful in converting Japanese to Christianity. The missionaries then got too involved in politics and would be expelled by Yushu. The revolt on Kyushu 
was because of the persecution of Christians, and the peasants revolted on the island of Kyushu and were bloodily suppressed. The Dutch would take control of Nagasaki, while all other foreign merchants were the next to be expelled. The Dutch escaped this fate by not allowing missionaries to interfere with trade and were allowed a trade in Nagasaki once a year for two or three months. Challenges to the Spanish Empire, New France. Following the solidification of the Protestant Reformation, both England and France turned their attention to the rise of the Spanish power in the New World and to the opportunities presented by establishing their own colonies in the Americas. Giovanni de Verrazzano, an Italian sailor for the French, attempted to discover a Western passage to India, but to no avail. He explored the coast of North America in 1524. Jacques Cartier made three voyages to establish colonies in the 1540s, explored the Gulf of St. Lawrence in Canada, and traveled up the St. Lawrence River between Canada and New York. After that, the French became mired in religious wars and lost interest in the area. Samuel de Champlain became known as the father of New France for his successful expeditions to the region in the 1600s. The French became involved in the lucrative fur trade in Canada and the New France region. Samuel de Champlain would lead this effort, and the fur trade remained important to the French and ultimately led to their establishment of trading posts and settlements on the Illinois, Ohio, and Mississippi River valleys. The Dutch, led by Henry Hudson in 1609, an English explorer, discovered the river that was named after him in New York. New Netherlands was established as a colony, with its capital at New Amsterdam, bought for the island of Manhattan for only $24. The deep harbor uh, was very susceptible, and of course the English would want it, and they would take it in 1644 without firing the shot, naming it after the Duke of York. English exploration in America. Sir Humphrey Gilbert and Sir Walter Raleigh. Gilbert secured a patent to establish a colony in the New World. After two failed attempts, he was lost at sea, and his half brother, Sir Walter Riley, established a colony in present day North Carolina. The expedition searched the North American mainland, which he dubbed Virginia, in honor of the Virgin Queen, Elizabeth I. They spied on Spanish defenses in the Caribbean and landed on Roanoke Island before returning to England. The first attempt established a colonizing party in April of 1585 to Roanoke Island, leaving Lane in charge. The colonists abandoned the area in June of 1586. Returning to England with Sir Francis Drake, Grenville returned with supplies to find the colony abandoned and left 15 men. The Lost Colony of Roanoke. Another expedition under John White arrived in July in 1587 and found no survivors, leaving another group of colonists. White returned to England one week after his granddaughter, Virginia Dare, who was born on August 18th, the first English child to be born in the New World. Unable to return until August of 1590 due to the Spanish Armada, White found no trace of the colonists except for the letters Croaton carved in a tree, the name of a neighboring tribe. A final expedition dispatched in March of 1602 made a futile search for survivors. None was found. Recent evidence has revealed that the colony experienced a severe drought during the time he was gone. And so ends the first unit on the clash of cultures. Virginia. The Virginia colony was established in 1607 when settlers traveled up the James River, which they named, and settled inland to hide their colony from Spanish and other forces that arrived via the sea. They named this settlement Jamestown after King James I. As this Virginia company was expected to turn a profit to their investors, the majority of settlers who arrived were more interested in discovering gold than planting. This led to hard times in the first winter. Jamestown is the oldest continuous English settlement in the present day United States. The Starving Years When the colonists arrived, they began to settle Jamestown. They were ill-prepared and quarrelsome 
expected to find gold, friendly Indians, and an easy living. Instead, they found disease, prolonged drought, starvation, violence, and death. Most of the settlers had no idea how to farm or were gentlemen who despised any kind of manual labor. Of the 105 that arrived in nine months, only 38 had survived. John Smith, who rose in leadership among the colony and eventually enacted a policy that dictated the only those who worked would be provided food. He who shall not work shall not eat. The Powhatan Confederacy, or the Indians of the area, known as the Powhatans, were led by Chief Powhatan. He established trade with Jamestown and helped keep the colonists alive for the first winter. In reinforcement attempts, more settlers, including several women, arrived in Jamestown from England in 1609 and 1610. Over the next few years, a series of revisions were made to the charter to make the colony more effective and help it grow. Finally, in 1612, tobacco was discovered to be a profitable export, and the colony began to experience a dramatic rise in its fortunes. By the 1620s, the colony was shipping 50,000 pounds of tobacco each year. By 1670, Virginia and Maryland exported 15 billion pounds of tobacco a year. Tobacco on a large scale did require more laborers in the field. Settling New England New England colonies were mostly founded by settlers who paid their own way to establish themselves in the New World. Very few were indentured servants. The soil in New England was not as conducive to cultivation, nor the growing season. Most of the early settlers did so purely for religious reasons. They wished to worship how and when they pleased, and usually settled with like-minded individuals. When Puritan separatists wished to leave England and settle in the Americas, King James I was more than happy to oblige them. The Plymouth colony was settled by the Pilgrims, who were the most radical sect of the Puritans. They believed that the Church of England still retained too many Catholic institutions, and they needed to be purified. Eventually, they would cross the Atlantic to escape persecution in 1620. On the voyage, they crafted the Mayflower Compact to govern their lives and their settlement. The Mayflower Compact was a covenant, a group contract, signed by the men of the colony that formed a civil body politic that was supposed to be based on just and civil laws. In early Plymouth, only male property-owning church members were allowed to participate in the government and to vote. They arrived in the middle of winter and settled in a former Wampanoag village whose residents had died of smallpox. By spring, they were reduced to half their number. Squanto, a local Indian man who had learned English in Europe when he was captured and enslaved, but who returned to find his village depleted by disease, taught the colonists how to grow and gather food in the area. Early peace with the Wampanoags helped Plymouth survive. Massachusetts Bay Colony The Puritans believed that the Church of England needed to be purified of any Catholic remnants left over by the Reformation. In 1629, Charles I granted a charter to the Massachusetts Bay Colony to allow Puritans led by John Winthrop to settle in the New World. Using a technicality, Winthrop headquartered the company in the colony itself, a revolutionary idea at the time. Winthrop and other Puritan leaders wanted the colony to become a model Christian community, a city upon a hill. They hoped that this model would then be taken back to England to be used for governing. The Puritan leaders of Massachusetts Bay worked to ensure that everyone in the colony became or remained Puritan. So despite that they escaped England for religious freedom, they denied that same religious freedom to others. They did not attempt to extend religious toleration or political freedom. Instead, they attempted to convince others to become more like the Puritan leaders themselves. Catholics, Anglicans, Quakers, and Baptists were punished, imprisoned, banished, and sometimes executed. The West Indies 
In the 16th century, Spain and Portugal began to decline as powers in the New World. In the West Indies, Britain would seize Barbados, Jamaica, and Bermuda. Their sugar factories out of Jamaica alone exported 50,000 tons of sugar annually, the white gold, with the work of 200,000 African slaves. The French would seize Saint-Dominique, Martinique, and Guadalupe. On Saint-Dominique, 100,000 tons of sugar with 500,000 slaves. The slaves would revolt in 1793 for their mistreatment and later on establish the second republic in the New World, the Republic of Haiti, toward a world economy. Economic conditions in the 16th century, inflation was a major problem in the 16th and early 17th century. Landed aristocracy, commercial and industrial entrepreneurs would prosper during this period. Stimulus to investment and capitalism and the growth of commercial capitalism. Trade flourishes in these three areas. The Mediterranean, Low Countries, and Baltic regions, inland trade would depend on the Rhine and Danube rivers. As overseas trades expanded, the Atlantic seaboard would now play an important role. New forms of commercial organizers, such as creating joint stock companies, where investors would buy shares into a company and receive a dividend on their investment. Investors saw a 30% return on their money in the first 10 years of the Dutch East India Company. Technological innovations, such as shipbuilding, mining, and metallurgy, brought back huge returns on investments. Banking, traditional family banking firms like the House of Fugger, were replaced by the Bank of Amsterdam in 1609, and they replaced stocks for goods and became the financial center of Europe. So banking has moved from Florence now to Amsterdam. The agricultural system, still 80% still worked on the land, most free from serfdom, but yet still had to pay high rents and taxes. This map, of course, depicts the networking global trade patterns of the European states in the 18th century. And as you're beginning to see, it is being dominated by really two countries, Great Britain and France. Mercantilism was an economic theory established by the French financier Jean-Baptiste Colbert. His economic activity was carried on by peaceful means. First, you needed a supply of bullion, gold, and silver, and payment of goods. A balance of trade favorable exports more valuable than the imports. Protecting export industry and trade by granting monopolies and imposing high tariffs. Encourage investment in new industries. And in the role of the state, colonies were a source of raw materials, improving transportation systems such as roads and canals. And government should be involved in the economic affairs for the good of the state. Overseas trade and colonies. Wealthy could afford the products coming from America, Africa, and Asia. Sugar, coffee, and tea would be available for most European consumers. From France would come wine and cheese, Italy, silk, Spain, wools and fruits. And overseas exports quadrupled for France from 1716 to 1789. The global economy began to establish and creating of what would be known as a triangular trade. The impact of European expansion the impact on natives, European diseases decimated whole tribes for which they were not immune. Hispaniola estimated the population of 250,000 in 1492. 25 years later, it was down to 60,000. 50 years after that, only 500 Indians. In the first century of Spanish occupation of the Central and South America, the Indian population was reduced by 85%. Latin America developed a multiracial society with less rigid attitudes towards race. Mestizos were mixed native and Spanish blood, and mulattoes were mixed African and European blood. In ecology, Europeans would bring cattle and horses and change the lives of the Plain Indians. Beef becomes a major exporter. Wheat and sugarcane would be planted. And they bring back maize and the sweet potato. For Africa, the impact of the slave trade had a devastating effect. Over 10 million were sold into slavery between the 16th and 19th centuries. Entire villages and empires were destroyed by their losses. 
In Asia, Portuguese trading posts in the East had little direct impact on the native Asian civilization. But what we also have seen is the Portuguese were always replaced by the Dutch, English, or the French. Catholic missionaries in America. Jesuits in New France had some success in converting the Native Americans to their ability of learning their language. They were called the Black Robes. Dominicans Franciscans were the first permanent settlements in the southwestern part of what would become the United States and were more eager to pacify the Native Americans there than to conquer them. In addition, they often begrudgingly recognized that the Native American nations in the Southwest retained greater power in the region than did the Spaniards. They therefore established missions in order to convert them to Catholicism to try to civilize them. These Native Americans who lived in the missions included many Hopi, Zuni, and Pueblo peoples seeking peace, and they agreed to move into the missions and become subject to the Spanish rule in exchange for promises to protect them from the Apache and other enemies. There, they were expected to provide labor for the missions. Even after the missions became secularized, many other Native Americans in the Southwest, however, especially the Apaches, resisted the attempts of the Spanish settlers or leaders to control the region. The missions were able to construct hospitals, orphanages, and schools. Nunneries were also established. Sor Juana Ines de la Cruz wrote poetry and prose as one of the best known literary figures of her time. Women needed, of course, to be educated, but despite even the Protestant Reformation, it was the Catholic women that were able to become successful. The Pueblo Revolt in 1680, Pope, a charismatic Pueblo spiritual leader, led an uprising of Pueblo warriors against a mission in Spanish settlements in New Mexico. By the end of the rebellion, these 2,400 Spanish survivors had fled and New Mexico had to return to Pueblo control. This became the greatest defeat of Europeans by Native Americans. Only after 12 years did old Spanish military leaders reestablish the settlements and military posts in the region. Presidios were the Spanish forts that would serve as a buffer against other European settlements. In China and Japan, the Jesuits also saw a great deal of success. They were able to convert 300,000 Japanese. Japan converted thousands on Kyushu and Shuku. The conquerors, get rich! White women would come for, to the Americas and chance to marry well, and they were able to control 25% of the land. The value of gold and silver in Europe in 1545 quadrupled. In the 18th century, there was a craze for Chinese furniture and porcelain, but there would be a series of Anglo-Dutch wars between the English and the French as well, and world wars for, that were fought worldwide for trade. The Mercurator map, as you see there, projected the true shape of the land mass, but only a limited area. It was accurate around the equator. And the further from the equator, the more exaggerated the land mass becomes. For example, Greenland is drawn larger than South America. And it would show the true direction of north, south, east, and west used for 400 years. The new view of the world natives was seen as either inhuman, thus can be exploited, or refreshing since they had not been corrupted. Both believed that they should be converted. The relative ease of conquering led to the belief in superiority. The Columbia Exchange. The two continents were very dissimilar in the manner of plants, animals, devices, and diseases. After Columbus's trips to America's future voyages participated in a sustained cultural disease and good exchange between the old and new world that has become known as the Columbia Exchange. Animals new to the old world, including the flying squirrel, iguana, catfish, rattlesnake, and armadillo. Animals new to the new world include horses, cattle, pigs, sheep, and goats. Plants new to the old world included corn, potatoes, peanuts, peppers, chocolate, tobacco, and pumpkins. Plants new to the new world included coffee, olives, wheat, sugarcane, and rice. Devices and substances new to the old world included canoes, 
snowshoes, hammocks, certain hallucinogenic substances used in Native American religious ceremonies, and the game of lacrosse. The vices and substances new to the New World include the use of wheeled carts drawn by horses, firearms, tobacco, and several drugs. Diseases new to the New World included smallpox, bubonic plague, malaria, and yellow fever. The transmission of these diseases killed more Native Americans than any other event. Scholars estimated that the infectious diseases brought by the Europeans and enslaved Africans killed up to 80 to 90 percent of the American Native population. But piracy would also emerge during this time period. And one of the pirates we're going to look at is Henry Avery, who was born in Plymouth in 1653 and spent several years as a midshipman in the Royal Navy on the HMS Kent and HMS Rupert. He was a slaver employed of the Royal Governor of Bermuda along Africa's Guinea coast. In 1694, he embarked as a sailing master and was first mate on the Charles II, a privateer. A privateer is something that governments would um, basically give a letter of mark allowing them to be basically legal pirates. More for the Spanish to raid on French smugglers in the Caribbean. Uh, the Charles II was a fast ship with 46 guns, and on May 7, 1694, the ship was in the port of La Conjuna, and the crew was growing restless because they have yet been paid, and now it's been eight months. So Avery would take advantage of the drunken commander, Captain Gibson, who was mightily addicted to what they said, the punch, and seized the ship. Gibson usually spent his evenings on the shore drinking himself into a stupor, and in some docks I dive, but on the appointed night, Gibson stayed on board to drink and was snoring in his bunk when the hour approached. So Avery and his mutineers secured the hatches, stealthily weighed the anchor, and started pulling out the sea, which would awaken the captain and the non-mutineers, who were asleep in their hammocks. Gibson was finally awakened by the motion of the Atlantic swells and the noise of the working tackle on the decks, and he rang the bell in his cabin, when Avery and the two mutineers entered, Gibson would say, What was the matter? Nothing, said Avery. Well, something is the matter. The ship, what weather is it? Avery would respond, No, no, we are at sea with a fair wind and a good weather. Gibson, At sea? Well, how can that be? And then Avery came close to the captain. Come, don't put up a fright. Put on your clothes, and I'll let you in on a secret. Then he explained the situation to him. You must know that I am the captain of this ship, and I am bound to Madagascar with the design of making my own fortune, and that all of the brave fellows to join with me. He gave the captain two options. Join him, or give up drinking, become a lieutenant, or be put to shore. The captain chose the latter. He renamed the ship the Fancy, and hoisted up with the Jolly Roger. The Roger was always used as a warning to other ships because what pirates hoped what would happen and proved to be very successful in doing is that as soon as they saw the flag, merchants would not even try to put up a fight. He then sailed off and was able to capture two Danish ships off the west coast of Africa near the island of Principe. Then he rounded the Cape of Good Hope dropped anchor in the northwestern Madagascar for provisions to careen the hull to make the ship go even faster. A legend is born. In 1695, the fancy now armed with 46 guns and a crew of 150 men was joined by the Pearl and the Portsmouth Adventure from Rhode Island and the Amnity from New York. The first ship taken was the Fath Mohammedi, which had 50,000 pounds of gold and silver. The gunsway, belonging to the great Mongol, had 40 guns and 400 rifles commanded by Captain Mohammed Ibram. And the first shot would bring down the mainmast, and a cannon on board the Ganji exploded, causing carnage and confusion on deck. The fight only lasted two hours, and Avery was met with little resistance when he boarded. Captain Mohammed Ibram was dressed up some Turkish girls as men and encouraged them to fight as he fled to hide himself below the decks of the hull. But they were able to bring on board some 200,000 to 600,000 
pounds worth of money, including 500,000 pounds of gold and silver pieces, ivory, and all this was coming from the Muslim merchants that were coming from Mecca. Avery would also bring slaves that he had also captured and then set sail to the Caribbean. There he had arrived in New Providence, which is the modern day Bahamas, and bribed the governor, Sir Nicholas Trot, with 850 pounds to allow him and his men to live there in peace. Now, for Governor Trot, this proved a tempting offer. The Nine Years' War had been raging for eight years, and the island, which the Royal Navy had not visited in several years, was seriously underpopulated. Trot also knew the French had recently taken Exuma, 140 miles to the north southeast, excuse me, and were now headed for New Providence. So Trot called a meeting of Nassau's governing council, likely arguing that the interloping was a fairly common crime and not sufficient reason for turning away the men, whose presence now aided Nassau security. The council agreed to allow the fancy to enter the harbor, apparently having never been told of the private bribe, which also included having the ship as well. Now, at the meantime, the great Mongol was now outraged and threatened to drive the East India Company, which we learned took a while to establish trading rights in India and all Englishmen out of his empire. So ambassadors to the crown promised to bring Avery in and his crew to justice. When the proclamation reached Trout, he was forced to put a warrant out for Avery's arrest or failing to do so would disclose his association with the pirate. Avery's crew split up, some remaining in the West Indies, the majority headed to North America, some, including Avery, returned to the British Isles. Of these, some sailed aboard the sloop the Isaac, while Avery and about 20 other men sailed in the sloop the Seaflower to Ireland and towards the end of June of 18 of 1696, it is believed. There they aroused his suspicion while unloading their treasure, and two of the men were subsequently caught. Avery, however, was able to escape once again. No one really knows specifically what happened to Avery. The popular belief is that he lived his life in luxury on a tropical island, or he was possibly swindled of most of his riches by merchants in the west county of Ireland and died in poverty in the village of Bidford, Devon. But this is just one example. And Avery, at his time, was a very, very famous pirate. There were plays and stories written about him before anyone heard of Blackbeard or Black Jack Bart and others. This concludes our study of the unit of Europe and New World counters. The map shows the Columbia exchanges.